I appreciate the opportunity also on this particular day. This is April 10th. Uh, and 50 years ago to the day, it was a Saturday 50 years ago, the uh, uh, American ping pong team that had been in Japan went at the invitation of Premier Zhou Enlai to China. And that sort of opened up the period that we'll broadly call the next 40 plus years of engagement. And of course, uh, last uh, uh, month in March on the 25th, Vice President Biden gave a press conference and he talked a lot about China and competition with China. And I would say, therefore, you know, we can sort of have bookends on this engagement period. We're now into a period uh, beyond and quite different from the engagement period that started that 50 years ago with the ping pong team. So we're in a transition moment. We're all trying to understand the new era into which we are moving, what its limitations and opportunities will be, and obviously, practically speaking, what are the prospects for cooperation or conflict in the future? So this is a, an important moment uh, that you've uh, decided to share this time with us. And uh, I hope that you will benefit uh, greatly. Now, I, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk about what has preoccupied um, my research life for the last six years. And that is the uh, vision of building a high speed and what we will call moderate speed uh, rail system from southern China in the uh, uh, emanating from the city of Kunming. And so if you look at the map, and this is just of high speed rail uh, and uh, uh, relatively rapid rail, the vision, it doesn't include all the fragments of much slower traditional trains in the region. But this is a vision of a uh, interconnectivity rail set of projects that start in Kunming up in southwestern China. And you can see those arrows radiating from Kunming. The uh, arrows going back into China uh, hook up to the high speed rail system in China. China has probably in excess now of 30,000 kilometers of high speed rail, and that doesn't include a more conventional speed rail. So the Kunming hub on the one hand hooks into China, and of course China is now hooking into Central Asia and into Eastern Europe and so forth. So this represents an opportunity for Southeast Asia to hook into China and then through China to much broader territory in Central Asia and on to Europe. Now, if you look at the uh, basic, uh, uh, go back to the Kunming hub, you'll note to the left, that's the uh, towards the west, uh, a spur goes off to Myanmar, Burma, uh, where there's Mandalay, there's Yangon, used to be called Rangoon, and then that line goes to Bangkok. From Bangkok, then you'll note down the Malay Peninsula to Singapore, a line goes on that long, narrow peninsula all the way to Singapore, which technically speaking is an island. If you go back to Kunming and look down centrally north-south, you'll see a line to Vientiane, the capital of uh, Laos on the Mekong River. Uh, and then the line goes down to Bangkok and hooks up with that line from the west. If you go back to Kunming and then go to the east, down south, you see Hanoi and then Ho Chi Minh City, Phnom Penh in Cambodia and Bangkok. So the first thing to note about all of this just to Bangkok is this key role that Bangkok plays. Uh, and Bangkok is sort of in this circumstance, something like Chicago was in the American experience. It was a maritime, in the case of Chicago, Great Lakes, um, transportation center, rail center, highway center, commercial center. Uh, and Bangkok in Thailand now sees its role as the sort of Chicago of Southeast Asia. Now, if you look at Bangkok, all those three lines come in there and then they hit that common line going down to Singapore. The, uh, the first thing to note is each of these lines from Kunming to Singapore is longer 
than the American Transcontinental Railroad that was built between 1863 and 1869. And that, uh, as we all know, transformed the character of the American continent. It made us a Pacific power. It made us a great unified nation after the Civil War. Uh, and along with the Panama Canal made us a Pacific power, indeed a colonial power uh, in uh, Asia. So what I would say is if this vision, and I'll mention in a minute what's been built and what has not, but if even a large fraction of this vision is in fact completed, as I believe a significant fraction will be, uh, there's no reason to think this won't economically and strategically change uh, the dynamics and development prospects, wealth, urbanization, education levels, and military projection power of China in Southeast Asia. So what interested me is that this is first a project that is, in, I wouldn't even say midstream, and it, it's in its early stages. Uh, it has transformational uh, potential, and there are a lot of um, uh, uh, issues that I think are very interesting to social scientists and political scientists that uh, come out of this uh, map. Now, the title of the book, I think, is interesting and conveys a lot about how we think and by we, I mean, this book was written not only by me, but fully equal uh, co-authors, uh, Selena Ho at the uh, Lee Guan Yew School at the National University of Singapore, and um, a colleague in Malaysia, Chung Chui Quick at the National University of Malaysia. So this was a, I'm doing the talking, but I had two, two other colleagues that are indispensable. Uh, I would say that, first of all, this was an enormous research task because it involved seven Southeast Asian countries, it involved China, and it involved uh, 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 Indonesia in as much as actually one of the first rail projects in Southeast Asia was built in Indonesia or is being built in Indonesia by uh, China. So we needed to look at that project as reference uh, for this. But in any case, I think no one scholar could do uh, such a large project covering so many large nations, so diverse, different political systems, different economic levels, uh, different cultures, and different experiences with China. Some have had much more benign histories with China than others. So anyway, big project. Uh, our information came really from two broad sources. One would be documents and uh, local newspapers, documents both from governments and international organizations like the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, uh, and, uh, of course, regional organizations like ASEAN, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. All these uh, states have governments and complex bureaucracies, and we needed to interview in them. So altogether, we interviewed in over 150 uh, organizations. And when I say interview, uh, uh, that's a kind of loose term doesn't imply necessarily just sitting down with one person for a protracted period, although that happened quite a bit. But sometimes, and particularly in the more controlled societies, let's say Laos or for that matter, China, uh, often uh, there's some hesitancy for individuals to speak to foreigners about sensitive topics. So they do one of two things. They either don't talk to you uh, or they bring a lot of people in the room so that there's a kind of implied um, structure to the situation. We can put it that way. But in any case, this took five years, and therefore the whole issue of how you finance such a, an extensive project over so long. And I do want to thank uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation for the support and uh, my home school of SICE and also Stanford University contributed. So I want to make it clear that this is a big, long project that a lot of people supported, and there were other 
other authors and I'm doing the talking right now, but it isn't all on me and my, I couldn't have done it. Uh, we, none of us could have done it without the other, uh, other two. Now, uh, this book, it seems to me, is, and this project and this issue of integration of connectivity uh, is important for a number of, of reasons. A number of questions can be, be addressed. First of all, there's a, in research, and, and as I think it's often true in teaching, you have to sort of formulate the question simply, straightforward, uh, simplistically at first, and then add on the detail as you go along. And the question that really motivated me to begin with, and I think in research you often just get struck with ideas at odd places. Uh, I saw that map uh, in a newspaper. And I said, and I'm a political scientist, I'm interested in political systems. Uh, I said, there are two, at least two dimensions to building such a system. One is of course, the engineering difficulty. Uh, and if you read about the Transcontinental Railroad, you'll, you'll read the saga of all the people who literally died building that. Uh, but in any case, in this case, the engineering alone is going to be a gargantuan task. If you take the, that north-south from Kunming to Vientiane uh, link through Laos, uh, that link alone is 70% is bridges and tunnels. In addition, in that er area where that railroad's going through, the U.S. dropped enormous tonnages of ordnance during the, quote, secret war, end quote, in Laos. And much of that or unexploded ordinance is still there. Some of the Chinese construction workers we talked to in that area said they wished the US would clean up the mess that we left behind. But in any case, the generic question, the first question really was, can China do it? Not only can China do it in the engineering sense, and we were pretty confident China can, and now we're absolutely certain China can do it, because it had built out a domestic high-speed rail system in its own country very rapidly. But the bigger challenge was, can China do it politically? I mean, if you look at this as a political problem, you're taking one administrative entity, China, 20% of the world's people, and you're trying to reach an agreement with seven other nations to build an integrated system that needs to seamlessly integrate from one country to the next, passing through different kinds of political systems, uh, poor countries, relatively richer countries, rural countries, uh, more urbanized countries, uh, and countries that have very different histories with each other, don't necessarily trust each other, and all of whom have different histories with China and don't necessarily trust China. So from our, our sort of operating hy hypothesis was to, to say, can China do it, uh, was a, uh, politically, uh, it's not self-evident and it is not self-evident to this day. So I think the can China do it question, engineering, yes, no question. It'll be tough, It'll there'll be implementation problems. A lot of people are gonna <clears throat> find that it's more costly than they initially forecast, but engineering wise, you can go to the bank on it, China can do it and is doing it. Uh, politically, that's what, still a lot of questions. Uh, you might say that uh, the line to the east through Vietnam is one of the most problematic because frankly, the Vietnamese don't trust the Chinese. Now, a lot more needs to be said than that, but that's a good starting point. Or look at that line to the west through Burma. We all are aware now what's going on in Burma with a domestic uh, between re uh, insurrection and revolution, uh, uh, insurgency, call it what you might. Uh, also in Southern Thailand, there's insurgent activity. Uh, also there are elections in countries like Malaysia and they change governments and different governments have different views. So this is going to be a long drawn out political process that will evolve over decades. But if you ask yourself, okay, on this map, what has been done to date? 
And if you look at that link from Kunming down what we'll call the central line uh, to the border of China and Northern Laos at a city called, or not a city, really a dusty village called Bo Ten, that line, the Chinese have built all the connections basically both to Bo Ten and, and Laos in the center to the Vietnamese border uh, in the east and to the Burmese border, Myanmar border in the west. So China's built its links to its three southern borders. But, but at the central line at Bo Ten going to Vientiane, that's under construction and it will. 99.99% probability be completed on or be about December uh, 31 of this year. So that line through Northern Laos uh, will, I, th I think, be done in this year or very close to it. Now from Vientiane down to Bangkok, uh, it gets complicated and I won't go into all the details, but let's put it this way, a little bit's been built in Thailand. They've agreed to build the, uh, the uh, Bangkok up to where their fork in the middle of Thailand, uh, Northern Thailand is, uh, and they're uh, also reaching agreement to go up to the border. The Thais already have a rail um, uh, right of way. That is, they have the land, so they don't have to clear too many people out of, out of the path of the railroad, which makes it easier. A little about three and a half kilometers of the actual line has been built. But I believe, just conservatively, you will have the railroad from Vientiane to Bangkok. Uh, by the certainly the end of the I would think certainly during uh, the end of the decade. So what you can say is that line from Kunming to Bangkok is is uh, almost certainly going to happen in this decade. Now the lines to the uh, west through Vietnam and Burma to the uh, east or to the west are much more um, uh, problematic, but I believe they will be built because there's a logic to the system. And that is the economic activity that results is gonna go along these lines. And if you interview people, governments and uh, business people in, in Burma or in Vietnam, they are afraid that all the economic activity would get sucked along that central line and they don't wanna be left out. So the basic dynamic is the more you build of an interconnected system, the more the logic requires others to cooperate so they're not left behind. Uh, just to illustrate this, and this is a, a point I think that's really important. These are real places with real people trying to make very big decisions that are gonna unfold over a long period of time. And you have to understand the, the position that each of these countries is in. And if you just take Laos, where there's the most progress in the practically the poorest country in the lot is Laos. In one of our first meetings there, I asked a planner, well, why are you with 7 million population, low GDP, taking on so much debt? How can you do it? And uh, he said, uh, well, just look. We're the only landlocked country in Southeast Asia. Other countries had their have their maritime uh, space or big rivers they can utilize. We have the Mekong, but it doesn't reach most of our country. Uh, and therefore we have to build our iron rivers. We have to build that communications and transportation or the Chinese are to go to Vietnam to the east or to Burma in the west and we will continue to be poor. So we have to take a big risk. Do we go into Hoc to the Chinese or do we stay poor? Choice is ours. So they decided to assume a, a high level of debt. Now, of course, the Chinese are taking a risk, too, because if the Laos don't pay back the debts, you're not moving the railroad out. You can't sort of dig the 
the ties and the tracks out and haul them back to China. So everybody's taking risk, although there are different kinds of risks. And in Q&A, we can talk about debt trap diplomacy and all of that. But what I'm saying is, is this book is about the challenges. Can China do it? Uh, how much agency do the uh, uh, the countries here have uh, in in shaping Chinese behavior? Is China just a leviathan stalking the countryside, sort of crushing everything uh, in its path, uh, in its weight? Uh, and uh, I'll come back to it when I talk a little about our central findings. But let's just put it this way. Each of these countries has a great capacity to complicate and throw sand in the gears of Chinese plans. China is not an unstoppable force bestriding the world and crushing all in its path. Now, any given village may feel that way. Some countries may feel more that way than others. But as an overall statement, we make a big mistake if we exaggerate Chinese power and underestimate the power of the, the, the countries and peoples who need to cooperate uh, with China. So one big question we had is, can China do it? And engineering wise, yes, politically, I think the answer will be partly, but never 100%, or at least it's going to take a long time till this whole thing uh, unfolds. Another big question is, how do we conceptualize development? And uh, just to make a very long and complicated story uh, short, but I think it has the essential features is, for the last 20, almost 30 years, the United States has not only not built its own domestic infrastructure, and we can talk, you know, President Biden and uh, what two plus trillion infrastructure plan represents the deficit in a lack of infrastructure in the United States that we've built and built and maintained over the last two or three decades. But similarly, in a foreign policy and foreign aid policy and the policy of the World Bank and even the Asian lesser extent, the Asian Development Bank, they also hesitated to build big infrastructure projects because so many big infrastructure projects have negative environmental effects. They move large numbers of displaced, large numbers of people, ref, internal uh, refugees. They create massive debt. Uh, there can be infrastructure problems that develop with the project. I mean, even in a country such as the United States, take Boston. We had the big dig, that big tunnel dug under Boston so you didn't have to go through surface streets to get around Boston. That project uh, originally was estimated to gonna cost two to three billion. It ended up, as I recall, costing 14 billion. It, it took twice as long as anticipated to build. And then practically the day it opened, a part of it collapsed and a lady was killed and they had to shut it down for a year. So what I'm saying is uh, these projects are uh, very difficult to execute. They almost always take longer and come in way over budget. And so for decades, the US didn't do much of this, both for political reasons and just for the difficulty of, of doing them. Well, in the last, I would say, eight or so years, it, big infrastructure has been coming back into vogue. And it's not just because China has built an entire interstate highway system in the last 15, 20 years. And it's not just because China built, uh, you know, 30,000 plus kilometers of high speed railroads, and not just because it built out a power grid in the big, one of the biggest dams in the world, uh, the Three Gorges Dam. Now, all of these projects in China had problems, but the fact is they transformed China for better or worse. Uh, and so infrastructure is coming back. And as uh, Clay mentioned, Xi Jinping coming into office, all presidents, whether they're in the United States or China, look for their signature projects. And Xi Jinping put his uh, legitimacy and the Communist Party's legitimacy behind this global effort to build infrastructure. And what we see here is one of six 
economic corridors in the totality of what's called the Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm looking at one subset corridor of this big plan and only looking at the railroad component. BRI also includes highways, power grids, uh, cyber connections, port development, industrial park development. So it's a comprehensive interconnected connectivity project of really enormous scale. And the United States under Biden, but even before Biden under Trump, realized the kind of magnitude of the effects this was going to have, that it would orient China, uh, Southeast Asian economy towards China and has now begun the process of responding. And in 2018, the U.S. government passed what was called the BUILD Act that appropriated a relatively small amount of money for building, helping build infrastructure uh, in Asia. Uh, we've also reconfigured our development assistance and infrastructure financing uh, bureaucracies. And so the United States is beginning, I would say, at a very small and probably at this point ineffectual level of response to this. But I think over time, just as though we uh, just as we will gather steam on our domestic infrastructure, I think in our foreign aid and development policy, we'll be trying to encourage American firms to get involved in this. So this raises a third question that is uh, important, and that is what are the strategic effects of this? And why is China doing this? Well, the first thing is that I think, you know, uh, political administrations, whether they're in democracies or in, um, you know, communist autocracies, they have to answer a question of what is it that legitimates their rule, rule in the eyes of their own people? What are you trying to accomplish that is good for us, the people? Well, Xi Jinping had an answer and has an answer to this. It may not be the right answer. It may be an incomplete answer. But his answer is China will be the hub of economic and human resource flows in Asia. That's basically his answer. And so you can see that Kunming hub, three of the lines feed back into China. And then if we had the whole map of China uh, up uh, north and west, it would feed into Central Asia. The vision is really staggering to make China the economic hub. And of course, countries like Japan or Korea have to ask, is that vision really in their interests? Or do they want to try to exert themselves to modify uh, the, take the rough edges off that vision? And just to make a long story short, I think the United States and Japan are not trying to, uh, so much to oppose what the Chinese are doing, but they're trying to build what you might call horizontal east-west connectivity from India on the far left part of your map beyond Burma to the, to the west, all the way across Burma, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos and build east-west connectivity. So what you're going to see is as the Chinese are building north-south, I believe there's a, going to be a countervailing set of projects and maybe the west, uh, Japan and the United States will be more and India more involved in that. So you really have a question, is Chinese power unlimited? No. Uh, how is the development process changing? Re-emphasizing infrastructure. What does this mean for the US and, the, and Japan and Korea and, and China's neighbors? And they are trying to offset the dependencies that uh, would be if, if China were just simply the hub with no other competition or balancing uh, connectivity. Now, um, I guess the uh, next thing I want to uh, talk about is what are some of the findings of the book? I said we uh, interviewed in over 150 organizations in all of these countries, all uh, seven Southeast Asian countries, plus China, plus Indonesia, because it had another project. So in a sense, what did we, uh, what are some of the conclusions of both the book and, and more broadly? 
the first conclusion is it's often asked, does China have a strategy? And of course, I always think, and I think it's true, to speak of China as though it has one mind, as though there aren't different voices in China is not true. China is a very diverse, fragmented place with lots of different views, lots of interests, and so on. So to say, does China have a strategy already oversimplifies reality? For example, many people in China would ask, why are we building all these expensive perhaps white elephant projects in Southeast Asia, when people, old people in China can't get adequate uh, social security, health care, we're a rapidly aging society, uh, we're going to need more and more domestic expenditure as our society ages, our economies becoming less relatively efficient with aging. We have many problems at home in China, why are we investing abroad? And so, you uh, have to ask yourself, why is China doing this? And I think, and often it's framed, is this an economic uh, project or is this a military project? Now, at some point it becomes chicken and egg. And, but I think it was originally basically an economic project. But once you establish factories and industrial parks and build out ports and so forth, you have assets on the ground outside of China. You have employees, tens if not hundreds of thousands of employees or Chinese citizens are abroad. You have to provide security for them. You have to worry about it. Uh, and so the military tends to move in, in a sense, uh, in the security apparatus behind the economic force. So before long, both the, the military and the economic interest groups in China move along these uh, pathways. But if you ask back to that question, why is China doing it? But I think they have a vision. And China's growth is over time gradually slowing. And as it slows and its labor costs become more elevated, higher labor costs in China, it wants to move its production chain, value chains, uh, particularly the low value added, labor intensive. Want, those industries are moving now towards many places, but in particular, Southeast Asia. So China is building its value chains, its production chains uh, to the south, not only to the south, but importantly to the south. And of course, uh, it then has even more reason to, to protect and be concerned about the security of its evolving uh, supply chains. So that's certainly uh, one of the uh, reasons. Also, the Chinese, as their growth is slowing, Southeast Asia is rapidly urbanizing incomes. It's a very big population. Incomes are rising rapidly there. And so as China, uh, uh, you know, the growth rate slows there, they want to put more and more investment in societies where the growth rate is going up. And so it's the way to keep Chinese growth going up, even though its own domestic growth may be gradually uh, uh, going down. Uh, also, I think, and, and there, I think many developmental uh, experts uh, agree that, and I don't want to make China sound like some philanthropist here, uh, but. Uh, you, if you're a, a, a country in a region, and China, let's take your China, you're going to do better economically if you're surrounded by countries that are doing well economically too. So China has a self-interest in promoting the develop, economic development of its region, and particularly to the south with this huge population. So the Chinese, uh, I think their answer to their own people is, we are building in Southeast Asia because we need to keep our growth up. We need to re reduce uh, labor costs on labor intensive uh, goods. Uh, if we don't occupy this area, I don't mean occupy 
in a physical sense, but don't occupy the economic space, others will. Uh, and so I think if to the answer is to the question, why is China doing it? It's doing it for both strategic and security reasons, but also in as an effort to keep its domestic growth rate going up. And also as China develops uh, its domestic highways, dams, and railroads, it developed the world's biggest steel industry, the world's biggest concrete cement industry. Uh, and it's building obviously all of the industry that now creates a world-class high-speed rail, uh, engines, uh, uh, rolling stock, and so forth. As China builds out its own domestic system, it needs to export all of these things to the world to keep all those people employed that previously were building things for China's own domestic output or uh, build out. And now it can, it can shift to providing that those goods and those raw materials, those construction materials to uh, societies outside. So I think it is both an economic and a, a strategic military undertaking, but its principal motive, I think, was economic, both for China itself and export industries. And the military comes in sort of behind it to provide security to increasingly value uh, added assets. Now, uh, I, I want to ask a, 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 a few other questions here. You know, what are some of the other conclusions we have? One whole set of questions you would ha have is, what are some of the difficulties the Chinese are facing? And as I suggested with my example of the um, uh, big dig in Boston, even a big developed, sophisticated, can-do society such as our own had problems in a big project. China has too. And among the prov problems are, uh, depending on which country we're talking about, you displace a lot of people. Who, how much are you going to pay for the land? Where are you going to put the new people? Uh, certainly a whole other set of issues is environmental. You've all seen those traditional uh, paintings, uh, the water and mountain pictures of pine trees growing out of karst, craggy mountains. Well, China in Laos and in southern China is putting tunnels right through those pastoral scenes. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, antiquity and culture and history that gets disrupted or destroyed, and that becomes a big issue. Certainly a big issue and a big fight in China is the whole question of uh, should we spend money on domestic priorities or foreign priorities? I had one Chinese come into my office and say, you know, Professor Lampton, we got a, a president now who every time he goes to a country promises him $50 billion. And we don't have enough money to do that. We have many domestic needs that are, are crying. We don't have the technological capability. And he was basically saying that one reason we built the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is so we could get other countries to participate with us so that we don't carry all the risk and all the burden uh, all uh, alone. Um, so uh, it, let me just uh, net out here with uh, the whole question of um, what do I anticipate is going to happen here? I think the United States is in a frame of mind that uh, we expect that um, we have two kind of expectations. One is that China uh, isn't going to have any problems, is going to build this, it's going to transform the whole situation, and we're going to be bystanders. So there's sort of that. But on the other hand, we're sort of in the frame of mind that everything China wants to do might be, by definition, not so good for everybody else around it. And I think if I would leave you with one idea is that the Chinese, in a very important way, share a central idea with the people they're working with. In this case, the seven or including Indonesia, eight uh, Southeast Asian countries. And that 
that is that the Chinese have an aphorism. If you want to get rich, build a road. Uh, and we interviewed, as I said, uh, political leaders in all the Southeast Asian countries. And for the, I think, down to the last person, they all pretty much agree with that. Their idea was that if you build infrastructure, you then create the pathways for money, people, resources to move. And so you don't wait for development to build infrastructure. You develop the infrastructure and the growth will come. It's a kind of field of dreams kind of approach. Build it and they will come. And in this important way, uh, the Southeast Asian countries, I think, pretty much agree with that. Now, of course, they all want the best deal possible with China. They want China to bear as much burden uh, financial and otherwise as possible, but they also want to maintain control of their own societies, protect their infant industries, uh, protect their own culture from dilution by China's culture and so forth. And so you have, it, it's not just these countries are anxious about China, they see opportunity with China. But on the other hand, they have their histories with China, many not so good histories. They have their fear of economic uh, penetration, cultural dilution, and loss of sovereignty. One of the big issues is along these rail lines, who controls the businesses that are built? And China is already investing along that, all these routes to dominate that. So, uh, or if not dominate, certainly play a big role. So what I, I, I hope this has uh, generated some interest. We'll see uh, around the other areas of China's periphery, um, uh, similar, I would guess, uh, dynamics. And I really look forward to your questions at the end and my colleagues' remarks on different aspects 